Thanks. Okay, good. It's good to have you with us, and it should be uh, a little um, a little different. Uh, we'll talk to you for a while, then you can talk to us. And basically, we've uh, uh, been looking at your book, Behold a Pale Horse. Now, how did you happen to write that? Well, it started many years ago when I was in the Navy, and uh, I uh, got a set of orders telling me to report for training for the Office of Naval Intelligence, and uh, I did that. I was trained specifically in Pacific Area briefings, uh, and then I was sent uh, for training for Naval Security and Intelligence, and uh, then I was sent to Camp Carter in I Corps in Vietnam, uh, where they sent me down to Da Nang to become a patrol boat captain, uh, in the harbor, and then later I was a riverboat uh, patrol boat captain on the uh, Takan River near the DMZ. Our base camp was Quaviet with the Donghaw River Security Group, which is uh, a branch of naval security and intelligence. When I rotated back to the United States after my Vietnam tour, I was uh, sent for three months on a destroyer to do an investigation for the Naval Investigating Service, uh, Naval Investigative Service, and then uh, I uh, was attached to the intelligence briefing team of the Commander-in-Chief of the United States Pacific Fleet. What I saw there uh, was shocking. I had no, I was, uh, I had not been prepared for this at all. What I discovered was that what was really happening with the government and the military was totally 100% different than what the public was being told. And uh, I remember one night uh, standing watching the command center as the petty officer watch uh, and watching on television as we were uh, launching uh, bombing raids into North Vietnam, watching uh, the president tell the American people that we had stopped all bombing raids in North Vietnam and that uh, we weren't conducting any bombing raids in North Vietnam. And uh, I began to have access to uh, top secret files and operations that had occurred and were ongoing at that particular time and operations that were planned for the future and um, I was so shocked and so amazed by what I discovered that I left the Navy actually five years before I could have retired very comfortably on everyone's tax dollars and began uh, investigating uh, all of this stuff that I had seen and that book is the result of that uh, 16 years of research based upon the documentation and the briefings that I participated in uh, while a member of the Office of Naval Intelligence. Well, now, uh, being in Vietnam, do you think that we really tried to win the war? Were we just fighting a war to perhaps distract American people from what was happening here at home? Uh, certainly, the, the war was not ever fought really to defeat the Vietnamese, was it? No, not at all. Uh, in fact, all wars since World War II, if you'll notice, have never been with the so-called... Uh, enemy of the United States, the Soviet Union, and then later uh, Red China. They've always been with third world countries as sur sort of a surrogate war. And the Soviet Union has never fought with us, our communist China. They have fought small surrogate wars with third world nations also. And uh, it accomplished several things. One, the war in Vietnam, and I'm talking specifically about this war and not others, uh, was started off to accomplish several things. One, it was to uh, buy uh, new methods of fighting a war. In other words, sending a, a young man over for one year and rotating him back to the United States uh, and uh, filling the war with minorities was literally designed to destroy a generation of, of young men, some of the finest young men uh, in this country. It was, a, um, it was a terrible thing to do to send someone off to fight a war. And most of the people who fought in Vietnam, despite everything that you've ever heard, were volunteers, most of them. Some, of course, were drafted and sent against their will, but most were volunteers. They volunteered because they were patriots. They thought and, and were, were told by their government that they were fighting a war for uh, our country and that it was uh, in the best uh, national interest of the United States of America to fight this war and that it was a war against communism. In, uh, in reality, it was a war to prepare officers through experimentation with new technology for their role as senior officers, and these were young officers who were getting this training, for senior, as senior officers in the uh, new uh, world uh, police force, which is coming. And, in fact, is in, is our military now is functioning as the world police force at this moment. It also was intended to destroy a generation of young men who would then be disgusted with patriotism, who would... 
uh, be disgusted with warfare, uh, who would turn against uh, uh, the country and uh, sort of drop out, so to speak, and would not oppose what is coming. Uh, in other words, we have a generation now of young men who fought in a war uh, who probably will not fight in the next one according to the estimates that, that the, uh, the intelligentsia have made, let's say. But I think they're wrong. I think that's not going to be the case. Anyway, uh, it also uh, was meant to be a population control in Southeast, Southeast Asia, according to the documentation that I saw, and was to protect the, uh, the uh, heroin uh, drug trade that was coming out of the Golden Triangle in Southeast Asia. And that had been traditionally the, most of the world's source of uh, heroin. Also, at the same time, the United States Navy in the South China Sea in the Gulf of Tonkin uh, instead of their primary mission being to support the troops on the beach in South Vietnam fighting the war, their primary number one mission was to protect and support the oil uh, exploration drilling ships in the Gulf of Tonkin, and second was to support and protect the uh, troops within South Vietnam. It never became a problem because we had so many ships there, that, uh, and that the North, Vietnam, uh, North Vietnamese Navy was destroyed early in the war, so they never were a threat to the uh, oil exploration ships. Well, I, I hate to say it, but I think that you're right. I think this war was fought against America. It wasn't fought against the North Vietnam. Absolutely. At the same time, I might add, there was a war being fought in the United States. Uh, Project MK Ultra was implemented. Uh, Dr. Tim Timothy Leary was one of the principal agents of the Central Intelligence Agency in conducting this war to destroy the uh, credibility and the effect that the so-called hippies or flower children were having upon the adult population and upon the political process. When they became addicted to drugs and when Dr. Timothy Leary, with all his credentials and academic uh, accomplishments made it legitimate to drop out and uh, and uh, toke up. Uh, it destroyed uh, the the uh, political process back home. It destroyed any hopes of of uh, making a quick ending to the war because that whole generation uh, was discredited. Uh, everybody looks back at that as a, as a real bad time in this country. Well, of course, I don't think most people were able to think it through very carefully. It's, we were given two choices. Either to back the government and there's no win war, or be a traitor and, uh, you know, pro-communist and try to get out. And they weren't very good choices. Nobody ever asked why, why a country the size of the United States couldn't defeat a nation the size of the state of Mississippi in ten years of war. And, of course, the answer was we never intended to. We didn't go there to win. We didn't go there to, to defeat communism. The war was aimed at the American public. Uh, well, did you have anything to do with Operation Phoenix? Do you know anything about that? I know about uh, uh, Operation Phoenix. Uh, yeah. I had no, absolutely nothing to do with it. But uh, it was, in fact, an, an operation that resulted in the assassination, in fact, the cold-blooded murder of uh, uh, the... Official estimates are around 20,000. The real uh, number is probably closer to 30 or 35,000 of the infrastructure of the uh, young patriot uh, leadership of South Vietnam. Uh, the American people were told eventually that Phoenix was killing off the leaders of the communist cadres, but that's not true. They actually were killing off the leadership that would have fought the communists when they came into Vietnam, and they were preparing the way for the takeover of South Vietnam by North Vietnam. But how can a country, you know, that's supposedly, you know, so honorable, have a planned program of assassination? I've heard uh, figures going up to 40, 50,000, but it doesn't matter. Even if 10 people were assassinated uh, and paid by the American government, how can you justify that? And how have they been able to keep that secret? I mean, that is one of the most carefully concealed secrets from the American public, Operation Phoenix. Well, they tried to keep it secret. It's not secret anymore. It's very well documented. It's out in the open now. Um, they tried to keep it secret because Americans aren't supposed to be assassins. We're not supposed to be murderers. We're supposed to perform honorably upon the battlefield, and we're supposed to adhere to the rules and treaties and things that we've made. But uh, in reality, uh, we don't really do much of that. Well, uh, there's a great 
deal of difference between, uh, you know, uh, the appearance and reality. Well, basically, I'm, of course, I'm speaking to my audience here in Santa Cruz, a fairly sheltered group of people who probably haven't done the research and study, you know, that many patriots like you have. And so I, I just throw Operation Phoenix out for those of you who are listening who have never heard of it. Uh, planned assassination, whether it was 20 or 30 uh, or 40,000 uh, South Vietnamese who were systematically killed on orders of the American government. And, uh, what was it? We paid so much for each person who was killed? How did that work? Well, it depends upon who was doing the assassinating. If it was people like Lieutenant Colonel James Bogreitz, that was his job. He was a, he was a part of that. If they were paid assassins or uh, South Vietnamese that were hired to do the job, then they were paid, yes. Okay, fine. Well, uh, you know, this is a, a tragic part of our history, and yet, you know, I'm sure you share with me the, the concern that we are moving towards a dictatorship here in America. And I know in your book, um, Behold a Pale Horse, you talk about the federal executive orders, which I doubt that many of our listeners have heard about. <laughs> Tell us, you know, because our, our people, and Santa Cruz is a pretty liberal area. We call it the People's Republic. Uh, we have uh, people who are Frank Marxists on the city council, and <laughs> and people were even further to the left some places on the, on the Board of Supervisors, although we did lose uh, one of our local uh, uh, left-wingers from the Board of Supervisors, and maybe things are beginning to turn around here. But can you tell our listeners a little bit about the ex federal executive orders that today are the law of the land in, in uh, the United States? Well, uh, let me start a lot earlier than that. Back in 19, uh, in the crash of 29, there was a terrible economic uh, disaster in this country. They call it the Great Depression. In 1933, in trying to deal with this, uh, the United States was actually on the, on the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, there were a lot of unemployed people. They were trying to implement a beginning of socialism in this country. Uh, they... Uh, um, uh, implemented a, a law that was uh, passed uh, during uh, World War One. It was called the Trading with the Enemies Act. Uh, it was determined that they could use this to uh, fight the economic war, uh, that it didn't have to be a shooting war, it could be any kind of a war or any kind of a national emergency. So they implemented by executive order the Trading with the Enemies Act in 1933 which literally put uh, the United States and its citizens under emergency rule, which means the Constitution, Hades Corpus, things like that are suspended. Now, they didn't tell the people that. And in the law, it specifically exempted the American people as being the enemy. Now, in 1937, they reissued the executive order again, only this time they left out that passage and the American people became the enemy. Now, we've been living under that declaration of emergency ever since then. So the concept that anyone in this country is protected by the Constitution today, or has been since 1933, is, is erroneous. It's false. And that's why they've been able to do many of the things that we've questioned. Like, how can they do that? That's against the Constitution. Obviously, that's against the Constitution. That's illegal. But they, they're doing things all the time, constantly, that tell us that the Constitution is no longer in force. Now, uh, later, in uh, 1945, Harry Truman signed the uh, United Nations Treaty, was ratified by the Senate, and they pushed through Congress, and, and uh, Harry Truman signed the United Nations Participation Act. Uh, they immediately pushed through and signed the National Security Act of 1947, and uh, created a veil of secrecy behind which they could operate to bring power into the hands of the United Nations and destroy the sovereignty of all the nations of the world. The Cold War was actually a manipulation of the people of the world to give them a fake enemy to pretend, uh, so that the government could pretend that the reason that they were doing all the things that they were doing, building the military forces and developing the technology that they were developing, was to fight this supposed enemy, this ideological enemy of the Soviet Union. And they were doing the same thing in the Soviet Union, telling the people there that we were their enemy. In reality, this had all been agreed on uh, by the, uh, the big three when they met uh, several times during World War II. And during these meetings, by the way, the reason why after World War II there was never another big war and all wars were surrogate wars fought in third world nations. The agreement was, according to the documentation that I saw when I was with the Office of Naval Intelligence, that uh, for population 
uh, control to keep the attention of the public away from what was really happening, which was bringing about a one-world government, a totalitarian socialist world government, the destruction of sovereign nations, that they would fight these surrogate wars and there would be no winner of any of these wars. And if you look since that time, no one has won any wars and no one has gained any territory through fighting of these wars. Uh, now, in, uh, uh, when Kennedy uh, became president, he signed the first executive order creating what's called FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. It was put into place to take over local, state, and federal government in case, and this is the way it was worded, in case of invasion by a foreign power or nuclear attack upon the United States. Um, Knock it off. I've got my daughter and her dog in the studio playing here. That's okay. Um, so, anyway, uh, he signed this executive order. This created the Federal Emergency Management Agency. They also began back in the 50s creating underground, literally, cities all across the country. There are these underground cities that have their own water supply and, uh, and everything. And they're in, un, in, under a mountain in Virginia, there's a place called Mount Weather where they even have a government in waiting. They have a president there, which is, has not been elected. They have a full cabinet there. They have uh, departments of all of the, of the government agencies in the United States and uh, uh, down there waiting in this place called Mount Weather. And they also have a computer data bank with a master warrant list where they're collecting the names and addresses of uh, known patriots and patriot leaders who will fight the overthrow of the Constitution overtly and the absorption of the United States overtly into the United Nations and the transfer of power of our armed forces to the United Nations, making them, in effect, a world police force along with the uh, military forces of what used to be called the Soviet Union. Uh, later on, Nixon elaborated on these executive orders. He changed them around, took out invasion by a foreign country or attack by a, a, a nuclear weapon, and it's worded very curiously now, uh, and then Reagan changed it, but, but uh, now the wording says, in case of internal unrest or economic instability. Of course, they can generate that at any time they want to. That's right. Just by uh, machinations of the Federal Reserve Board. That's correct. Financial crisis or... In fact, I, I have uh, really seriously wondered if some of the patriotic leaders that are going around now may very well be creating fear and getting people to organize just to create the suffer crisis that could justify the implementation of dictatorship. Do you sense that? Well, um, I don't think that so. I think that there are some patriot leaders who are not patriot leaders who are trying to identify those patriots who will resist the destruction of the sovereignty of the United States by force of arms if necessary to restore the Constitution and the Bill of Rights to their legal and lawful place as the supreme law of the land. Uh, I know that um, that uh, there's going to be, in this country, if they don't back away from this encroaching socialism, if they don't return the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, to their lawful and legal place as the supreme law of the land, um, there will be uh, civil war in this country to do it. There are men who will not go in to uh, give up uh, what so many people have lived and died for to put together. Uh, um, the United States of America. Most Americans don't even understand that until the Constitution and the Bill of Rights were uh, penned by our forefathers, that no people on this earth had ever been truly free until that time, and even since that time, we're the only people on the face of this earth who have truly been kings and queens in our own right, and have had the rights and the protections of those rights uh, uh, in, in the history of the world. And uh, right now, today, all of the, of the protection of the rights guaranteed us under the Bill of Rights, or the first ten amendments, have been stripped away. Some of the rights in the seven articles of the Constitution we have lost. Now, most Americans don't understand this and don't know it, because most Americans, unfortunately, aren't really Americans and have never read the Constitution, don't know what it says. And if they did read it in their life, it usually was in a high school class when they had little Susie or little Johnny on their mind, and they really didn't care much about what they were reading. Of course, 
actually the teacher would interpret it for them and tell them the First Amendment says the wall of separation between church and state. Is, and well, the, the truth is there is no separation between church and state. Our forefathers uh, put uh, an article in the Constitution which forbade the government from respecting any institution of religion. Of course, you know, but the funniest thing is you ask the average person where the, uh, the wall of separation occurs, and they will invariably tell you it's in the First Amendment. I mean, that's because they never read the First Amendment. Yeah, the First Amendment says that the government has to keep their hands off religion. They cannot pass any legislation or laws respecting any institution of religion, period. That's all it says. It doesn't say that you can't be religious. It doesn't say you can't say prayers in school. It does, in fact, it was never meant for our schools to be run by the government. Then that's the truth on, the, uh, on that matter. Sure, in fact, at the time the First Amendment was passed, uh, all of, I think, all but one of the uh, 13 colonies had a state religion. Religion was a matter that would be left to the states and to the people, not to the federal government, and there was never any intention of, of, uh, of preventing the Bible or Christianity from being espoused in schools. Everybody knew this was a Christian country for many years, until uh, until recently, when uh, 1962, the Supreme Court, which obviously had a certain prejudice, simply without any legal precedent, uh, without any justification, other than uh, the, the uh, testimony of a psychologist, said, well, you know, there is a wall of separation. Uh, do you mind taking a call here? We have somebody on the line who wants to talk to you about Iron Mountain. No, go ahead. Okay, hi, Ben. How are you there? Hey, had to run to the phone. Yeah, Bill, what's happening? I met you at the, uh, the, uh, what was that? Preparedness. Uh, preparedness meeting in San Jose at the convention center. Uh-huh. But, uh, I've been keeping track of a lot of your information, and it's, it's pretty much right on the money. And there's something else that needs to be talked about here, or maybe you have, I just couldn't get. And that's the, uh, the either phony or real alien threats they're talking to galvanize the New World Order. So, all right, you want to cover that at all, uh, Bill? Phony are real threats that they're concocting to galvanize the New World Order. Um, the aliens, the uh, UFO bit. Well, it's not just that. It's a lot of things. They have a lot of concurrent um, uh, plans operating on us all the time. Um, for instance, this global warming thing is not real. The uh, ozone holes are not real. Uh, the UFOs um, could be uh, an operation to create an artificial enemy from space in order to uh, uh, justify asking all the peoples of the world to drop their national sovereignty and come together in a one world government so that we could face this threat together. All of these things were outlined in a plan uh, called the Report from Iron Mountain, which surfaced about 1966. Uh, supposedly Kennedy had ordered this study done, and it took several years to do it. It was done in secret. The first meeting was held in a repository of corporate records called Iron Mountain, and uh, then they had meetings all over the place for the next several years. They uh, put together a report. The purpose of the meetings and the study was to, uh, uh, to study the possibility and probability of... Uh, of uh, permanent peace and uh, what would be the necessary ingredients to make it happen and what would have to occur to make it last. Uh, so one of the, the first thing that they uh, arrived at, the first conclusion they arrived at, that all economies in the world uh, were based upon a war economy. In other words, nations and governments existed and, uh, and they were held together and their economy worked because they had a common enemy somewhere. And throughout history, if you look, it's basically been true. I don't think it's necessarily true today, but nevertheless, that was the conclusion of the report from Iron Mountain, that there had to be an enemy. Now, only way you could do away with war is if you had an enemy that could replace war but did not require the killing of people. For instance, an environmental war, intentionally and purposely polluting the environment to create a state of tension and worry and uh, foreseeable uh, disaster in the future uh, for which you could mobilize all people to pull together and uh, see the common enemy and want to work to uh, address that uh, environmental hazard. And for many years, the large corporations who belong to these organizations who make these plans and bring them about uh, were dumping uh, large amounts of uh, 
of pollution and hazardous chemicals and waste material into lakes and rivers and streams and into the atmosphere. It was done intentionally. It wasn't an accident. Uh, and it brought about the, cre the, the, the desired result. It did mobilize people. And a lot of those environmental concerns are real. But the point I want to make is that some of them were done by greedy people who wanted to make a quick buck, but a lot of it was done by major corporations who are part of this plan trying to bring about a one-world government, and it was done intentionally. Uh, things were created that are uh, uh, fiction, imaginary uh, things. Uh, for instance, the uh, ozone hoax, as I like to call it. There is no layer of ozone around the Earth. Ozone occurs throughout the atmosphere. Ozone is created and destroyed uh, every single second, uh, simply because ozone is a is a radical molecule. It's made from uh, two atoms or two molecules of oxygen splitting, making four ions of oxygen, or four ion atoms that are independently floating around looking for something to attach to. Uh, one of them will attach to a an oxygen molecule, which is O2, already has two atoms of oxygen, making it O3, which is a, a radical molecule. In other words, it's looking for something to oxidize instantly. And the minute that it finds something that will oxidize, this uh, third atom of oxygen breaks loose from the O2, and it does exactly that. Now, they say that, that uh, uh, ozone is protecting us from the ultraviolet rays of the sunlight, and that's the biggest fantasy in fiction that's ever been created. The truth is that ozone is created by ultraviolet light coming from the sun, it comes into the atmosphere until it reaches a zone or a, an area in the upper atmosphere where the concentration of oxygen molecules are such that it begins to strike oxygen molecules at a rapid rate. This causes a chemical reaction which depletes the energy in the ultraviolet light rays, and it splits the oxygen molecules, causing these two atoms, now free from each other, to seek out something to attach to. When they attach, when they uh, bump into another uh, molecule of oxygen, they attach, and that creates ozone. So ultraviolet, ozone doesn't protect us from ultraviolet light. Ozone is created by ultraviolet light coming into the atmosphere. And if it were not for this happening, if ozone were not created by ultraviolet light, then we would be in danger of, uh, of being burnt to a crisp by ozone. The truth is, as long as there's oxygen in the atmosphere, and as long as there's ultraviolet light coming from the sun, there will be plenty of ozone in our atmosphere, and we don't have to worry about it. We don't produce enough CFCs to even make a dent in the ozone in any portion of the atmosphere. One volcanic eruption in one day will deplete more ozone in the atmosphere than the entire history of the human race has ever done. Well, one of the other things they never mentioned is the floral cut. Uh, the coral uh, fluorocarbons uh, are actually heavier than air, so they, they don't go up in the atmosphere. That's right. They never get up that high. But they, they just never bring this out. Yeah. Also, you, you might want to um, ask people when they talk about this ozone hole baloney. I'd say something else, but I don't want to shock anybody out there. When they talk about this ozone baloney, that uh, if their, their uh, assertions were true, if their allegations were true, the ozone hole would be over New York City, would be over Los Angeles, would be over Tokyo, would be over London. It wouldn't be over the South Pole when there's winter at the South Pole. There are not very many people using hairsprays down in the South Pole. That's right. The truth is the ozone holes occur over the poles only when that pole is experiencing winter at the pole because the Earth is tilted on its axis. No sunlight is striking that portion of the atmosphere over that pole in the winter. They have six months of darkness. Therefore, the chemical reaction does not take place. Ozone is not created. And you get these photographs of supposed holes. Okay, Ben, any other questions? Yes, um, there's something I wanted to point out that a lot of people didn't really take notice of. You know, I find it, it, it was funny. One friend, one friend of mine, an ex uh, second force, uh, he was an ex in, in the Army, noticed this on the news. And it was when they released that serial rapist up in Oregon the camp that they showed that he was staying in, the concentration camp on the outside, and it was, a, you know, the sprawling behavioral modification facility that uh, he was aware of that they have all over the United States, and he noticed that they showed this on TV, it was like a, a mistake, they weren't supposed to show the sign or something, and they said, and he 
<laughs> well, I didn't see it till. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was on the news when they when they showed the uh, camps and the serial rapists. Sure. Okay, fine. Well, thanks. Thanks so much, Mr. Ben. Okay. Bye bye. But just for the listener here, this book, the report from Iron Mountain, I can remember in 1966 or 67 when it came out, and it has been reprinted. And one of the things it said, you know, other than over and above what uh, Bill Cooper's already told you, was, well, look, if if we have to, we'll contaminate the entire planet, but we need to have this enemy, the the environmental threat. That's how we're going to control the people. And you see this thing unfolding, uh, you know, regularly, whether it's in Rio or where it is, and all sorts of scientists, for instance, the Heidelberg Memorandum, uh, signed by, you know, a hundred or so Nobel laureates, said this whole environmental movement is a scam. But you never saw that on controlled CBS, ABC, or NBC. That's correct. Let's go ahead and uh, talk to Tony here. Hi, Tony. Yeah, hi, Doctor. Um, hi, Mr. Cooper. Hello. Um, yeah, Read your book, and uh, um, I had a, I wanted to update on that Jonathan Maine fellow. If you had anything new on him, and uh, I thought it was a very interesting story. And I was kind of wondering, like, what happened to the property he had. I have no idea. He was released from prison uh, about a year ago, and from what I understand, he's not the same person. Uh, he, he, I don't know what they did to him, but uh, he's just not the same person. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it, because I don't know the story. Well, he was uh, he understood that uh, what what was happening to our economy and our money system. He was from England. Um, he had developed a, a method of using his own personal wealth to uh, purchase large amounts of um, undeveloped uh, land that contained, uh, by proof, by exploration, X uh, amount of tons of uh, natural resources of gold, silver, um, uh, bank and still backed by silver or gold. A bank backed by the natural resources uh, that the that the bank would then have backing its its currency. It would then issue a different kind of of money. It, they, w they would be credit vouchers, in effect, that would be backed by real wealth. This these natural resources that had not been reclaimed or, or taken out of the ground or cut down and made into paper or whatever, and. Uh, uh, that way, they could get out from under the uh, debt um, uh, system that uh, everyone is being subjected to now. For instance, our money used to be backed by gold and silver coin. In fact, our money, by law, is called a dollar. A dollar is defined by law as a specific weight of measurement, or specific, specific measurement of weight of gold or silver coin. A dollar is really currency only as long as it can be exchanged for gold or silver coin, which is r the real money of the United States of America. The debasement of our coinage, by the way, the penalty uh, of which is death, if you're convicted of debasement of our, of our money. And uh, the money defined by law and by the Constitution is gold and silver coin, nothing else. Now, if you have gold and silver coin, you can issue silver certificates and gold certificates as long as whoever holds them can turn them into any bank or to the government and receive that much of weight of gold or silver uh, in coin of the realm at any time they so desire. But uh, gold, ownership of gold was made illegal back in the uh, 30s. It was taken away from the American people when they uh, implemented the Trading with the Enemies Act. Uh, later, um, uh, gold certificates disappeared. Uh, then um, uh, they withdrew silver coins and began uh, minting what we call uh, uh, copper clad. Uh, and they put a little layer of uh, silver alloy on the outside of these copper coins uh, so that the sheeple, the stupid people, <laughs> would uh, think that they still had the same value in their hand when they had these coins. The fact is they were debased and they were, they were worth no more than the copper content. Uh, in the coins, and then they took away the silver certificates and began issuing Federal Reserve notes. Federal Reserve notes will be the death of this nation economically simply because it is a method of constant and consistent inflation through borrowing non-existent money which is created by bookkeeping entry. When that happens, the Federal Reserve asks the Treasury to print up the bills. 
they've just created by a bookkeeping entry. Bear in mind now, the Federal Reserve is a private corporation, not an actual agency of the United States government. So when they did that, uh, and, and created this phony money, and had the uh, Treasury Department print this money, they paid exactly what it cost to print the money. The Treasury Department did not make a penny. They then take this money and buy a United States Treasury bond with this money that's interest-bearing. So our government now has this money they created out of thin air. Our government gives them a Treasury bond, which is interest-bearing. This money then goes out into circulation into the country through the government paying its bills and paying the salaries of the people who work for the government. And then we, the American people, have to pay this money back that never existed through real wealth, the creation of, of uh, substance through our work, the sweat of our brow. And then, not only that, but we have to pay back the interest, which was never created in the first place, guaranteeing that we get poorer and poorer every year and that the value of the dollar shrinks every year. For the last uh, 40 years, we've gone from a dollar uh, value of 100 cents down to approximately 10 cents today. It's probably closer to 8 cents, but... I won't quibble over a couple of pennies because uh, it's the stupidity of allowing this to happen that is that is the the real uh, the real thing we need to understand about ourselves. And so every dollar that is actually out in circulation, we have to pay interest, and we pay it to the bankers who own the Federal Reserve, because the Federal Reserve is a privately owned central central bank. That's right, and the Internal Revenue Service is the collection agency for the Federal Reserve. When you uh, when you write a check to pay your uh, your taxes, your income tax, if you're a taxpayer, when that check comes back to you and it's gone through and you've paid your taxes and it comes back and you get it from your bank, if you'll turn it over and look on the back of the check, you'll see that it was not deposited to the account of the Treasury of the United States of America. Instead, it says, pay to the order of any Federal Reserve Bank in payment of United States obligations. So the money that you pay in income taxes doesn't even go into the United States Treasury. The Treasury gets its money from other things, from excise taxes, gasoline taxes, import-export taxes, things of that nature, which, by the way, are, are legal taxes, income taxes not. Right. And, uh, you know, the, <laughs> I, heard, I heard about this fellow. He'd go into a, a restaurant, and when the bill would come, he'd, he'd say to the waitress, uh, can I pay this? Uh, this bill was Federal Reserve notes, and the, wait the waitress would look a little surprised. And she'd go over and get the manager, and the manager would say, you want to pay this with Federal Reserve notes, what are they? <laughs> <laughs> and I think every person should do this, because what we need to do is let the American people come to realize that somebody has stolen our monetary system. They have done it by a very careful and deceitful manner. The Federal Reserve is no more an agency of the federal government than the Federal Express is. And we are enslaved by an organized effort uh, to control the banking and ultimately the currency of this nation. We've been taken over, fellas, and they create wars for their purposes, for their profit, and their ultimate goal is the new one world order. Well, that's correct, and uh, I'll go you one better than that. Ever since we've been using Federal Reserve notes, uh, they have literally taken over the nation, and we have become indentured servants. You see, when you operate on a debt system like that, you're not paying your debts. If you go down and buy a car with Federal Reserve notes, you've committed an illegal act if you actually think that you own that car. And it, if you try to own it, it's, it's illegal. The truth is, is you cannot purchase something or pay a debt with an instrument of debt. A Federal Reserve note is nothing more than a note. A note is an instrument of debt. It says somebody owes somebody some money, and it hasn't been paid yet. So you're taking that instrument of debt down, and you're using it to purchase something, or buy something, or pay a debt. You cannot pay a debt with another debt. You cannot purchase something with a debt that hasn't been paid. And that's when Americans began receiving warrant deeds to their homes and to their land instead of allodial patent titles, which really means that you own it. If you receive a warrant deed, it warrants that a deed exists, but you don't have it. The true owner has it, and you have to pay a property tax, which is a rental on that property that the true owner actually owns. Um, also, 
it applies to other things, too. For instance, you no longer get a title to your automobile or to anything else that you purchase with Federal Reserve notes. You receive a certificate of title, which certifies that a title exists, but again, you don't have it. The state has it because the state owns that property until the debt is paid. In other words, we have now become indentured servants for the debt of the United States of America because this money has been created out of thin air and the interest is never created, thus making it impossible to ever pay the debt. People are talking about balancing the budget, paying the debt. Uh, it's, it cannot be done. The currency does not exist. It is possible if you pay off your, your land or your property in gold or silver coin and then pursue a process through the courts. You can do it, yes. Uh, yeah, the sheriff in Arizona is not going to enforce the Brady Bill. It's unconstitutional. It's unconstitutional uh, according to the Constitution of the State of Arizona. It's unconstitutional according to the Constitution of the United States. The second article in, in amendment uh, says that the, um, a militia being necessary to a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The law also specifically states that the militia is not the National Guard and it is not the military. The militia, the unorganized militia, consists of the whole people and specifically in the law, it specifically states all, all male citizens between the age of 17 and 45. Therefore, it is against the law, against the Constitution of both the federal and the state government to take weapons away from anyone who constitutes the militia. But you know, it's, it's so interesting because there is a massive program, as you well know, to take the guns away from the uh, public. I, last weekend was at the meeting of the California Medical Association, and those of you who are out there will be happy to know that the California Medical Association House of Delegates voted that everybody who has a gun or ammunition uh, or uses a gun uh, has to have a license. And the doctors and representatives voted for that. Uh, this is the path to dictatorship. And when I got up and, and made a statement to that effect, uh, you know, there, there were so many of the people the audience just sort of scoffed. But, they're, you know, the doctors there who are 30 or 40 years old who have gotten into the House of Delegates of the CMA so they can and use the, the policy and the political power and the lobbying efforts uh, which are generated by doctors paying dues to the CMA to bring about the dictatorship in America. And the average person in America has no idea the new crime bill is aimed to take to totally pitch the uh, Second Amendment and take away the guns from the people as a prelude to the establishment of the dictatorship in the New World Order. Would you agree? Uh, absolutely. And... Uh uh, these people, these PhDs, these doctors, these university professors, these so-called uh, intellectuals uh, who are promoting Marxism and socialism uh, aren't as intelligent or smart as they think they are. If they were, they would go back and study history. And if they studied history, they would find that whenever socialism comes to power, the first people that socialism destroys and places in labor camps or outright executes are the intelligentsia, the university professors, the lawyers, uh, the PhDs, all of the people who promoted Marxism and socialism and brought them into power are the first people that they throw into the labor camps are, are, are completely 100% exterminate simply because they're the people who, once they see socialism actually at work on them, will be the first people to turn against it. I agree. And, uh, but I, I think that the American people must understand that what is happening is, is a carefully planned program. In fact, I was watching television this evening, and they had this black and white uh, uh, sequence where these children with the sad faces, they were making remarks, and sort of a hopeless feeling, and then the caption at the end was, we must stop the violence. Well, the basic theme is we're going to take the guns away from the law-abiding citizens and stop the violence? No way. I mean, those are the places where they've taken the guns away from the people, New York and, and Washington, D.C., they've got crime rates three or four times out of the surrounding areas. Every, every place that has uh, laws that saying that the, the populace cannot own weapons has uh, the highest murder rate in the, in the country. They have the highest crime rate in the country. Uh, like I told you, these so-called intellectuals 
aren't smart. You can be intellectual and not be smart. My grandmother used to tell me that you can have all the degrees in the world, but if you don't have one ounce of common sense, uh, what good does it do you? Well, I, I think that these people have an agenda. And you know, the Absolutely. They're Marxists. They really believe that they're going to make the world better by taking freedom and rights away from people and putting them in shackles so that they can control them every second of their life. They don't understand that they're also going to be in those shackles. They think they're going to be the leaders. <laughs> well, uh, Solzhenitsyn started out as a socialist, a hardline socialist, and it wasn't until he got to the gulag that he suddenly uh, uh, did an about face and became, you know, a return, returned to God, and suddenly realized that, that the horror that he, he and the other idealists had created, believing that man be able to create a better society. Sure, they lionized uh, Stalin, and Stalin is the greatest murderer in the history of the world. Conservatively, he killed 40 million people, and that's conservative figures. He probably killed many, many more million than that. Uh, plus... For the, for the people here in Santa Cruz, I want you to know, I got an invitation this last week to a meeting of the Communist Party. Uh, Mr. Bill Wood invited me to a meeting over on the uh, west side, uh, just off of... Uh, Mission Avenue on, on Saturday afternoon uh, and told me that, of course, they, they did this because I think the People's Daily World, or People's Weekly World, I guess it is now, and they had my name on the mailing list, so I got this nice personalized invitation. The head of the Northern California chapter of the Communist Party was going to be there, and, uh, you know, all the local communists are going to be there. People think we don't have communists. Of course we have communists. And we have socialists, and we have Marxists. In fact, we probably have more Marxists here you know, at the University of California here in Santa Cruz than they have in Moscow. The people in Moscow don't really believe in this. People up here at UC do. That's the tragedy. There and in Washington, D.C. Well, sometimes you got to experience it to uh, understand what it is. Well, Me, all i got to do is read about history and what they've done in history, and I don't have to experience one bit of it, and I'm not going to uh, as long as I'm able to... Uh, to fight, I'll, me and many, many other people in this country will fight to our death before we will allow it. Well, I think one of the hardest things for the average citizen to understand is that many of the people who are pushing Marxism the hardest are the people of great wealth and great influence and the great foundations of America, Rockefeller, Found, Carnegie, Ford, Fund Fun the Republic, and it is these foundations, these people of great wealth who believe, you know, that this concentration of power is going to be in their hands. Well, that's what they believe, but, uh, you know, Stalin uh, would teach them different. Mao Zedong would teach them different. Uh, Fidel Castro would teach them different. Hitler would teach them different. By the way, Hitler was a socialist, uh, and we might as well square that up right away. Everybody out there talks about the left and the right and the extreme left and extreme right, and they always put Nazis on the right. And that is an illusion, a delusion. It's a fantasy. It's not true. Nazis are on the left. Nazis were socialists. National socialism is just a little bit above communism. They are both on the left. Communism is extreme left. Nazis, national socialism is just a little above communism. A republic is somewhere toward the middle. Extreme right wing is total anarchy. It's no control over anyone. And they, they're, they're putting out these deceptions so people will think that there's something wrong with the right wing. The right wing people actually want more freedom for everyone. Extreme right wing or anarchy is just as bad as extreme left wing or communism. But there are no Nazis in the right wing, I guarantee you. It's a deception because the New World Order will be something along the lines of what Hitler planned. I'm, I'm sure you're right. Well, then we've only got about a minute here before we have to break for the news. Uh, what are we going to do the next hour? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, while you're breaking for the news, I'm going to link up on the satellite and get ready for our broadcast. Right. And uh, I'll have my uh, daughter here. Now, I won't be able to take calls during my broadcast, but we'll be able to take calls from your listeners. Uh, my my three and a half year old daughter is going to be uh, helping me with this broadcast tonight. We'll be going worldwide by satellite and shortwave. All right, very good. So uh, we'll, we'll break off here, and I'll just put you on hold, and we'll be back right at the uh, right on the hour. Okay. Okay, yeah. thanks so much. You're welcome. And this is Dr. Stan here. You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. And I'm Pooh. 
Oh, boy, we had your pot way up there, didn't we, too? Yeah. Uh, who else is here with us? Sugar Bear. All right. Well, folks, we're going to be coming to you uh, with, in conjunction with another broadcast in uh, near Santa Cruz, California. I believe it's Santa Cruz. Right out of Santa Cruz, in there. Mountains overlooking beautiful and picturesque Monterey Bay. And we have Dr. Stan with us, and uh, we've already done one hour on his program, and I, we may be the first people who've ever done this. I don't know. Has anybody else ever done this? We've done it, but never on shortwave before. We did it, I think, once or twice before. A fellow named Stonebrunner somewhere in the east. But this is, a, you know, an amazing opportunity to, uh, to talk to people all over the world. Uh, that's true. Now, are you on AM or FM? No, we're an FM station. This Actually, we do an AM broadcast in the afternoon, and then we do an FM broadcast in the evening. So this, we're, right now we're on FM. We're all of Monterey Bay area. Well, great. Well, I think uh, I recognize a lot of the names there. You know, the Lucius Trust, Albert Pike, uh, Lord Maitreya, uh, the New World Order. But for the people who really aren't very well educated, they wouldn't understand it. I understood it. Because, of course, the common denominator is Luciferianism, which is what energized Albert Pike and the Masons, uh, Lord Maitreya, which is the New Age Messiah, uh, who the New Agers think is coming. Uh, and, of course, the Lucius Trust was an outgrowth of the Theosophist. Right. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, you must have a much better um, uh, educated audience than, than ours, although I hope our audience is becoming better educated all the time and is coming to understand how all of these... Uh, or secret organizations interlock in the, the drive towards the establishment of a one-world dictatorship. Well, I, I hope so. Uh, I've been broadcasting for two years now, Dr. Stan, and uh, uh, I've devoted this hour to educating the sheeple, hoping that they'll become real people and screw their head back on straight so that we can get back on track. It would be terrible if throughout the history of the human race man had struggled to finally become free and stand as a king in his own right if we marched backward once again into slavery under socialism. Well, what it encourages me is that, you know, it's, you are doing what you're doing and there are people all across this country. I was on a, a network out of Wisconsin this morning put on by Dick Eliasson, uh, I think in Milwaukee, and he is broadcasting that trying to get the truth out across the nation. And, there's a John Leffler in, in uh, Colorado, and there are dozens of people around the country that I've run into who are, you know, making the sacrifice to get on the radio and putting in the time and effort, and certainly the financial investment to try to get the truth to the people and help them to understand how it all works together, but it's really a spiritual battle being played out on a political battlefield. That's correct, and unless, uh, unless your audience think we're some kind of religious kooks out here, the these people don't really believe in Lucifer as Christians look at Lucifer. They don't believe that there's a devil. They don't believe that there's a Satan. They don't believe that there's a Jehovah or a Yahweh or any of those things. Uh, they believe in a pantheistic uh, God. They are deists. Uh, they, uh, they believe in the Luciferian philosophy, which is a metaphor when they uh, talk about it. And that is that man was held prisoner in the Garden of Eden, in the chains of ignorance by an unjust, vindictive God, and he was set free by Lucifer through his agent Satan with the gift of intellect or primordial knowing, the use of which man is in the state of becoming. Becoming what? Becoming God himself. They believe that ultimately man is God. I, I agree with you totally. Well, we have a caller on the line here. She's, <laughs> she called in just before the hour, so let's see what Gina has to say. Hi, Gina. Good evening, Dr. Stan and your guest. Uh, Mr. Bill Cooper, Bill Cooper. Bill Cooper, we thank you very much for broadcasting the news behind the news. You are just about practically very few of you who are doing uh, such a job. And it's not easy, an easy job because the opposite people do not want to, uh, to have this kind of news broadcast whatsoever. But you are with the truth, and therefore the truth. Uh, will make us free. I have a question for your guest and perhaps for you, Dr. Stan. Not too long ago, on the radio, I uh, heard uh, Linda Thompson, and for the people who don't, do not know her, she was the one who uh, brought this tragedy of Waco to the, to the focus so that people would know exactly what has happened there. But Linda Thompson on that show that I heard, 
he said that, oh, Oprah just said that the federal judges now are paid directly by the executive branch in the USA. That was really mind-boggling to me. And then I heard that who is uh, taking care, who is at the top of that? The UN. I was flabbergasted. Well, so, let's, let's find out if yeah. Bill knows anything about that. Okay, and I will question. hang out. Okay. Bye-bye. Uh, Bill, did you get the question? Yes, I did, and she's absolutely right. Uh, it's done because we are living under emergency rule, uh, which means that uh, the rule of the Constitution is really not in effect. They give us the illusion that it is, and uh, they are in the process of taking away the guarantee of the rights of the American people, what we and our forefathers called creator-endowed rights, uh, you see, there are no constitutional rights. There are creator-endowed rights. The Constitution is to protect those rights and limit the powers of the government. Well, those uh, those uh, protections are being uh, stripped away. Uh, as I said before, we have no more rights under the Bill of Rights. Some of the rights that we used to have uh, protected by the body of the Constitution are gone. Under the Treaty of Bretton Woods, uh, um, the uh, Secretary of the Treasury who is Mr. Lloyd Benson at the present time, cannot accept a salary from the United States government. Instead, he is paid by the International Monetary Fund, which is an arm of the United Nations. Um, uh, the ATF, or the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, actually works for the United Nations under the Department of the Treasury, created artificially by the Treaty of Bretton Woods under the International Monetary Fund. The United States Treasury is in limbo and, in effect, does nothing, uh, supervises nothing, prints no money, mints no coins, uh, nothing whatsoever. Uh, the uh, um, the uh, IRS, Internal Revenue Service, is also under the Department of Treasury, working to collect the national debt of the United States and transfer the wealth of this country into the uh, hands of the Federal Reserve and the International Monetary Fund, where it can be redistributed to third world nations. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I've heard this before. How in the world would we ever document? Would Lloyd Edison admit who pays his salary? I've documented every single bit of it. We have 628 pages of documentation of official United States uh, government documents, United States Code, uh, statutes at large, uh, State Department documents, documents signed by the President, executive orders uh, over the last 50 years. It proves without a doubt that there is a conspiracy, that it was being worked from the beginning, that none of it has been hidden, that at the present time the Constitution is not in force, that we are, in fact, under the United Nations Charter and the resolutions passed by the United Nations. We're in the process of... Uh, of eliminating uh, arms in all uh, nations, eliminating the concept in international law of sovereign nation states, stripping the arms from the American people, and uh, eventually the military forces of what used to be the Soviet Union and the United States will be united into a one world police force and no other peoples or nations will be allowed to be armed except for a small internal force which will be armed uh, um, lightly to uh, to subdue internal unrest. And this is sort of goes along with the fact that we're sending uh, Soviet astronauts up with our astronauts, and uh, we're bringing sci Soviet scientists here, and then we, our our educator uh, uh, researchers are working with Soviet education researchers. Goes uh, much. You sort of merge the two countries into one. Yes, it goes much farther than that. We have mi Russian military officers in our military academies. We have our officers in their military academies. They have uh, people here attending our law enforcement academies. Uh, in the Open Skies Treaty, they overfly the United States daily with bombers and military aircraft and reconnaissance aircraft. The reconnaissance aircraft are specifically equipped to monitor the disarmament of the United States. They have Soviet uh, um, Politburo members and members of the military in the United States at specific stations in the United States to monitor the disarmament of the American people and of our military forces. The next thing you're going to tell me, Gorbachev is going to be in the Presidio. Gorbachev is in the Presidio, illegally I might add, and has been for over a year, illegally. Uh, he has set up the Gorbachev Foundation there. 
The Gorbachev Foundation is a foundation set up to promote the idea of one world uh, socialism government. Of course, you know, I, I think every Republican will be happy to know that the Republican National Central, uh, the Senatorial or Congressional Committee, just gave him $70,000 to give a talk. That must have been an amazing talk. He, he must be a very, very powerful speaker to get paid $70,000. Or is it that the Republican Party is subsidizing Gorbachev, and maybe at the top there is not a great deal of difference between the pro-communist Democrats and the pro-communist Republicans. Well, there, there isn't at all, and that's why it doesn't matter who you elect to the presidency, nothing changes, everything keeps getting worse. You keep getting poor, the dollar keeps being devaluated. Uh, inflation continues to occur. Unemployment continues to rise. And uh, they've been manipulating the unemployment figures so that Americans don't understand the true tragedy of unemployment in this country today as we move uh, toward, more towards socialism and as American uh, uh, corporations move out of the country into foreign countries where they can get cheaper labor. And uh, this all, of course, is in the process of lowering the standard of living of the average uh, American. The intent is to eliminate the middle class, which Marx called the bourgeoisie, and uh, bring about two classes of people, the rulers and, of course, the ruled. Um, this is all in the process of coming uh, about. Uh, unemployment figures are skewed in that they don't count the unemployed period. They count only those people who are receiving an unemployment check, and only for the period of time that they receive that check. If someone runs out of unemployment benefits, they are not counted anymore as being unemployed. If someone is not entitled to unemployment benefits, but they're unemployed, they are not counted as being unemployed. People who are homeless are not counted among the unemployed. People on welfare are not counted among the unemployed. People on general relief are not counted among the unemployed. The truth is, Dr. Stan, the unemployment rate in the United States today, if you count the true figures, is higher, much higher than it was in the Great Depression. I'm not surprised at all. You know, one of the hard things, I think, for most people uh, listening to is to believe that there could be a conscious program to merge America and the Soviet Union. It's Years ago, I had heard about a man named Norman Dodd, who had uh, been the chief investigator for the Reese Committee, which is a congressional committee, I'm sure you know about it, that investigated the Great Foundation. So I tracked Norman Dodd down, and I actually uh, did a taped interview with him where he told me about going to the head of the Ford Foundation, Rowan Gaither, and Rowan Gaither said to him, Mr. Dodd, why are you investigating the Ford Foundation? Why is Congress investigating it? And uh, before Mr. Dodd could answer, Rowan Gaither said, uh, perhaps you'd like to know the true purpose of our investigation. We hear, uh, pardon me, you'd like to know what the Ford Foundation is really doing. Uh, we here are operating under a presidential directive. Uh, we've been with the OSS for years, most of us. And that directive is to so change America that one day this country can be peacefully merged with the Soviet Union. If I had heard him say that myself, and actually I'm sorry I don't have the tape of that interview, but I have it upstairs, and maybe we can play it together sometime. It, it's difficult to know that this is a, a planned program of, of, you know, this is 40 years ago when um, uh, Norman Dodd was told that. Norman Dodd's long since dead. But this is a long-term program to merge America and the Soviet Union into a one-world system. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, but you see, nothing's hidden. We've documented it. Anyone can duplicate our research. Uh, every single document that we have can be found in any good uh, university library or law library. It can be found in the Library of Congress. It can be found in any of the federal uh, repos records repositories across the country. Uh, as I said, and if, if anybody wants to get a packet of information from us, send a self-addressed stamped number 10 size or business size envelope, and we'll send you a packet of information. And if you'd like to purchase this documentation, once you receive that packet of information, uh, it'll tell you how to do that. And you can send it to uh, CAGI, C-A-J-I, P.O. Box 1420. That's P.O. Box 1420. Sholo, spelled exactly like it sounds, S-H-O-W, new word, L-O-W, that's Sholo, S-H-O-W, new word, L-O-W, Arizona, 85901. 
One more time. Kaji. C-A-J-I. P.O. Box 1420. Sholo, Arizona. 85901 USA. We are broadcasting around the world by shortwave radio 100,000 watts, WWCR in Nashville, Tennessee, and by satellite, Galaxy 3, Channel 17, 5.8 audio. <laughs> well, let me, uh, let me put it apart. Uh, I have reprinted a book called Foundations to Power and Influence, which was written by the uh, counsel for the Reese Committee that investigated the Great Foundations for which Norman Dodd, who I talked about a little earlier, worked. And of course it was an amazing uh, investigation. Every effort was made to stop the investigation. They even sent a congressman named Dwayne Hayes to the committee meetings to disrupt them under the presidential order of Dwight David Eisenhower. But eventually they did commit, uh, have at least a year to investigate and uh, all the copies of the investigation uh, the congressional investigation disappeared, but the council wrote a book, and it was never distributed. It was uh, published by Devin Adair. They just couldn't get it out. And a few years ago, I was given the place to this, and I've republished the book, uh, Foundations to Power and Their Influence, showing how the great foundations were pushing Marxism in America and trying to destroy the patriotism which every American should feel for this country. In fact, that's what Congressman Reese says in the preface to the book. And if you want to get the book, it's available by calling our 800 number, which is 5HIV War, W A R, because America is under siege today. We're at war, and most people don't even know the war is going on. But if you read that book, one of the most important books ever published, which is why I republished it and tried to get this circulated, you will understand that powerful and wealthy people are working to destroy this nation and to merge us into this one world system, exactly as Bill Cooper said. Uh, that's a that's a fact, Doctor Stan. And uh, like I said, anybody that wants to look, wants to get their nose dirty and get in some books, and I know that's not popular to get in books today. You got to see it on videotape or on television, but you can find it, and um, it's not difficult whatsoever. The truth is, is that Senator McCarthy was right in the fifties. He was absolutely right on target. He was vilified and destroyed by the uh, left wing Marxist press in this country. And uh, the the uh, the plan to subvert this nation, destroy the sovereignty, and create a one-world totalitarian socialist government has been marching right along on schedule. Don't you think that maybe McCarthy was getting too close to the Council on Foreign Relations, and he didn't even realize that? I mean, because there's always been a force behind communism in this country. I mean, uh, uh, the communists didn't have enough money to maintain the Communist Party. It was always subsidized by people of great wealth and great power. In fact, Carol uh, Quigley, Bill Clinton's mentor at Georgetown University, talked about that in his classic book, Tragedy and Hope, how that the communist movement in America was financed by the great bankers. They wanted to keep it under control. Well, that's correct, but the bankers aren't the ones in charge. It's really very, very powerful people who control the secret societies uh, that are running the show. That's why Americans look around and they can't see an enemy. They know that this country is being destroyed. I, I can't go anywhere in this country without being approached by uh, people saying, Bill, something's terribly wrong. I can feel it in my gut. I see our freedoms disappearing. I see things happening like Waco, Texas, and the Weaver incident up in Idaho that don't make sense. This is not America. This is the Soviet Union. And uh, they're absolutely correct. They look around and they try to identify how this is occurring, and they can't see it because it's their mother, it's their father, it's their uncle, it's their grandfather, it's their brother, it's their sister. It's all of these people who belong to these interlocking secret societies and organizations, uh, both public and in secret behind the scenes, that have one goal together at the highest levels. And a lot of time, the people at the bottom in these, these organizations don't even realize that they're a part of it. I'm sure that they don't. I'm sure there are lots of idealists who think, wouldn't it be wonderful if man could create a better society? And, of course, they don't realize they're not going to create a better society. They're going to destroy the greatest society that has ever been known in all recorded history. Let's go talk to Dave here. Hi, Dave. Hi. Incidentally, Bill, this is a uh, uh, local talk show host. He is on another station in the area. does a great job of... Uh, of doing interviews with people of a conservative bent, and is actually he is a, his station is much more powerful than mine. <laughs> actually, uh, I was going to ask Bill if he still has Stan's uh, bearings. 
No, Stan uh, left us, uh, gosh, it's been over a year now. I was running around that time ago where I tried to contact you and left some messages and didn't talk to you. I can't hear you. I've lost you. I can't hear you at all. Can you hear him now? Uh, I'm, I'm no, I can hear you. I can't hear him. Oh, you can't hear, can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Yeah, I was, I was saying it was about a year, a little over a year ago that I had talked to a fan about trying to have you on the program, and uh, we talked a few times, he sent you some information, and then he never called back again, and I just said, well, it's one of those things that I haven't pursued, but I, uh, you uh, now I've lost you again. Hello? Yeah, now you're back. Oh. <laughs> hey, you know, I was going to ask, while, uh, while you're on the phone, that uh, I, I talked to Linda Thompson, and she mentioned that you basically had fake her some face on this uh, scandal that was going on where uh, she had been fed some false information, and you were the only person to come forward and warn her about it, and, and consequently, you know, kind of save a little bit of her reputation. And uh, that she said that she had talked to Bo Greg about the same thing, and he made it sound like everything was going on. I'm just wondering if you had, had any, uh, if you talked to you know Bo Greg at all, because uh, I, I've gotten different information on, you know, like I guess condescending, wisecracking me, I guess towards you or about you. I mean, I'm not trying to hear any laundry, but you know, I mean, a lot well, of people. What, what's that all about? Let's not, let's not create. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, uh, I used to be one of uh, Greitz's greatest supporters until I found out who he really was. And when I found out who he really was and what he was really up to and what Delta Force really stands for, and we found a, a briefing given by a lieutenant colonel on a uh, an army concept to help bring about one world government called the First Earth Battalion, uh, a training film for young officers uh, that was made back in the, in the early 80s. Um, then I began to investigate the Greitz and found out that he changes his religion with his audience. He never says anything of substance. He was, in fact, in charge of Operation Watchtower in Central America, which was the umbrella security for the drug planes coming in from Central America to the United States via Homestead Air Force Base, and we've been exposing him. But i got a break right now because we have to take a short break and do a commercial, so I'll be right back with you in just a minute or two. Okay, fine. You're listening to the Hour of the Time, worldwide by shortwave radio 5.810 megahertz, WWCR Nashville, Tennessee, and satellite Galaxy 3, channel 17, 5.8 audio. We're doing a simultaneous broadcast with Dr. Stan near Santa Cruz, California, and of course, the Hour of the Time, and we have Pooh in here in studio also. Did you have something to say, Pooh, to the radio audience? Uh, you just want to smile at the microphone. <laughs> okay, you can say goodnight later, okay? Yeah. Well, Dr. Stan, are you there? I'm going to say something else, David. Yeah, um, on, on your book, The uh, Behold the Pale Horse. I can't hear you now. I passed it around to a few friends, and people go, Now, he talks a lot about Zionism in there now. Is this kind of one of those, you know, uh... Aren't he kind of a freak guy? And I'm going, why, why would you get that? I mean, you can read about the guy's background and everything else. So I wonder if you could maybe dispel some of those uh, talks about the world's uh, bankers or the Jewish conspiracy and anti-Zionism and all this kind of stuff that uh, people are readily accuse anybody that tries to you know, put out any information about. Well, uh, sure, absolutely. Zionism, in the first place, has nothing to do with Judaism or with Jews or with the state of Israel. The state of Israel has been established, and that was the Jewish goal of Zionism. International Zionism is actually a part of British Israelism. It's worked through the secret societies, and its main protagonist, uh, of course, is the Freemasonic Lodges, which are controlled. Uh, from England, also the Ancient Order of the Rosen Cross, the uh, Knights of Malta. Uh, it is a racist uh, uh, group. They use the Jews to promote uh, their agenda. And uh, I could go on and on and on, but no, it has nothing to do with anti Semitism, which, by the way, is one of the tools that they use when somebody gets too close to the truth. They label them as an anti Semite. And then all the fools and the sheeple out there hear anti-Semite and they turn off their ears. Intelligent people listen to everyone, read everything, believe nothing, but they pursue a program of real research looking for the truth, not agendas. Okay, good, good, good explanation. That's 
Services. Thanks so much, David. Right, thank you. Right, right, let's go to Bill here. Hi, Bill. Hi, Dr. Sam. See, I, I was sure we were going to hear from Bill. Uh, Bill is, uh, is an expert on the basis. Came right in on the coattails of uh, hearing about people being called anti-Semitic. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Well, you know, Bill is obviously aware of the Masonic uh, curse on America and the world. And um, I think about how many people, not only our related brothers, sisters, etc., but also sons, daughters, daughters, etc. And, you know, you read in the Bible there are curses on families for certain things. And when people sell their soul to the devil, there is a family curse. And I see the, the whole country pretty much involved in this curse. And it's basically... Um, generations of people who at least are hoodwinked. Or hoodwinked. Hoodwinked is an excellent term. And so, you know, people ask, well, why aren't these people waking up? Well, guess what? Um, they're cursed. And, uh... Well, now, Bill, do you have a question? Uh, well, uh, yeah, I wonder, well, a lot of things, but for instance, well, why, why do we allow our politicians... Uh, why do we allow anybody to be a politician in our country who has already taken an oath to the leader of an organization that goes back to the, the Queen of England as basically the person who they've taken this oath to? Okay, fine. Uh, let's let's let Bill answer that. Did you get the question? Well, you have to you have to ask the sheeple about that. I I don't vote for those politicians <laughs> myself. Uh, you see, we don't pick who we vote for. And it doesn't matter who we vote for on a, on a higher level, um, it's always uh, someone who is furthering the agenda of international socialism, uh, of international Zionism, of the promotion of the one world government, if you will. Uh, I wish that, uh, you know, someone asked, uh, the last call I think asked about uh, the Jewish thing, the anti-Semite thing. I wish Jews would wake up and understand that what's happening here is the same thing that happened in Germany as Hitler began his rise to power. The same things are going on, the same New Age, the same occultism, the same rumors, the same uh, proliferation of prophecies and Nostradamus and all this thing. Everyone then was looking for a Messiah. Everyone now is looking for a Messiah. And I'm telling you right now, if you're not careful, you're going to get one. And the same thing is going to happen when that Messiah mounts his throne. Well, I, you know, the, the, the similarities are so striking. The, the way the homosexuals are being manipulated in this whole thing. And, and the fears of the people. Every, everybody's looking for that strong man who's going to get us back to, you know, to a, a prosperous, stable society. Uh, there was tremendous crime. There was tremendous unrest in Germany in the 20s. And it was this that, that encouraged people to look for the new leader. And, of course, they got one, and he was an occultist, but he was also backed by powerful people both in the United States and England. Yes, and I might add that he was also extensively financed by some very wealthy Jews. Uh, so uh, you have to understand that there are all different religions and all different kinds of people involved in this. They are devoted to Marxism, to socialism. They're devoted to one world totalitarian government. Uh, you can't blame this on one race. You can't blame it on one religion. It is an organization of secret societies that at the very highest level is ruled by a racist point of view that the Anglo-Aryan race is superior to all others. And it manifests itself as British Israelism. In this country, it manifests as uh, the uh, white uh, Aryan supremacist uh, uh, and uh, what they call Christian identity. Okay, fine. Let's, let's uh, go here and uh, let's see. Bill, do you have anything else? Well, I was wondering, um, you mentioned that... Um uh, Gorbachev was in uh, the Presidio, that's in our area here. Yeah, you can drive down and shake his hand if you want. Uh, no thanks. I wonder if he's gotten together with um, our, our local uh, uh, Michael Aquino, uh, Lieutenant Colonel up there at the Presidio, who's the uh, <laughs> Satanist and child molester. I don't, think he's, uh, I don't think he's still up there at the Presidio. I would advise all your listeners to get Gorbachev's book. The name of it is Perestroika by Mikhail Gorbachev. 
you haven't read it, read it, and you will learn the true meaning of democracy, and you will all of a sudden understand that this is not a democracy, was never intended to be a democracy. This is a republic, and all you screaming liberals out there that don't know what a republic is, you better learn, because we're going to bring it back. I hope, I hope so. I had a uh, ex a United States senator, as I guess, this afternoon, and he kept talking about how we had to make the American democracy work, how we were formed as a democracy, and I, I, I don't like to attack my guests, so I, I bit my lip, and I was, he was a very nice man, and very dedicated to what he believed in, but what he believed is wrong. America was never a democracy, and that was the one thing that our leaders always said, is that we don't want a democracy, for democracies are air spectacles of turmoil and contention, are air incompatible with private property and personal liberty, and are usually as short in their lives as they are violent in their deaths, and that comes from the tenth of the Federalist Papers. Get it and read it and ask yourself, why wasn't I ever told that to school? Why did the man, James Madison, who wrote the Constitution, say that if, if this is a, a democracy? And, of course, we were never meant to be a democracy. That's correct. Well, thanks so very much. Thank you, Dr. Bye-bye. And we've got Tony. I think Tony's got one more question here. Tony? Um, yeah, hi. Um, I want to ask um, Bill about uh, uh, Bo Bright since you brought it up. And, um, he was making a lot of uh, uh, news about going to Southeast Asia and identifying uh, drug dealers, I think, in Cambodia and Thailand and links to Richard Armitage and... Uh, I was wondering if you, uh, if you could have any opinion on that, and also about his involvement at um, uh, Ruby, Ridge, Ruby Ridge up in Idaho. Uh, you know, I heard a lot about how he, he placed these uh, uh, troops under no, he didn't place anybody under citizen's arrest, period. It was all a scam. He was actually working for the FBI. He was wearing an FBI wire. He was called by the FBI and brought there by the FBI. And the whole thing was a, was a scam. Makes Grice look real good. Patriots flock to him. He gets more names and addresses of people who would fight for the Constitution. He, he was talking about Randy Weaver uh, back in the early part of uh, 1990, uh, two or three years before the thing ever even happened. Yet he claims he never knew anything about it until the FBI called him. Okay, well, I... I, uh, I could go on and on and on and on and on if you wanted me to. The guy's a, he's a Trojan horse is what he is. All right, fine. Well, I... I um, uh, uh, anyway, my, my, my producer is telling us we've only got eight minutes more before we have to go up. Uh, well, anyway, it, it's been a fascinating, fascinating time, and I certainly appreciate uh, your being on with us this evening and have the opportunity to share ideas, and maybe we can do it again sometime. Well, thank you for sharing the broadcast, and I'm really sorry that Greit scared you all away. Oh, no, but no. we call a spade a spade no, on this show. <laughs> I want to get all sides, because I, I'm not taking any sides in this. Oh, nobody asked you to. Fine, then you may be entirely right. Uh, we've, we've proven it, in his own words. We've aired many hours on this broadcast of his own words, which convict him. Well, do you have those tapes available? Can we uh, purchase those tapes? Absolutely. All right, how, uh, we, we get them by writing to the same number. Write to the same number, ask for our information pack, uh, send a self-addressed stamp number 10 envelope and $1, and we'll send it right off to you. And we would get the information pack on, uh, on Colonel Rights as well? Well, you'll get a list of the tapes of our broadcast, which tell you which ones we aired on Grites, and if you want to order those tapes, you can. All right, fine. Well, now, that is KG... C-A-J-I. C-A-J-I, uh -huh. Post Office Box 1420. That's correct. So low, Arizona, 85901. That's right. And so I'm going to send and uh, get some of that information. I hope some of our listeners will want to as well. And um, no, I just uh, didn't want to get into a... Uh, a long dissertation of, uh, uh, you know, on, on this subject, and you may be entirely right. I don't know. I am very concerned uh, because Bill Bright is organizing paramilitary organizations, and I, I am very fearful that these can be misused uh, in this country. The last thing I want to see is people beginning to violate the law because that will be used by the other side to justify the implementation. That's right, but and, and, but uh, people should be looking at the history. He was David Duke's running mate as the vice presidential candidate in the election before last. He is now in the state of Idaho setting up a center for white separatists, and he and Jack McClam have purchased a large section of land for white separatists to go up there and live so they'll all be together uh, to uh, try to... Uh, 
uh, form a, a, a an Aryan nation of the uh, four uh, upper four uh, northwest uh, states of the United States, according to the Aryan plan. Uh, and I could go on and on and on. He gave a Nazi salute up at uh, up at uh, uh, put the thing in Idaho to the skinheads. And anyway, uh, get the information pack and uh, get the tapes and listen to them, and then you'll know. Okay, fine. Well, thank you so much, Bill. I really appreciate it. And hope we can get on here uh, and we can do it again sometime. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, okay, folks. We got an open phone line if you want to call in and talk for the next uh, five or six minutes. And then we'll play. I'll give you that address again where you can get the, uh, the uh, music cuts. And then we'll sign off for another night of the hour of the time. The number is 602-333-2174. And good evening. You're on the air. Nope, you're not on the air. Okay, the number is 602-333-2174. Good evening. You're on the air. Yeah, Bill. Uh, I just sent you this information. I got it at the uh, Financial Times Friday, March 25th. It's uh, about the Loral Corporation. And uh, it's about the Defense Electronics Aerospace Group said yesterday it assembled a group of strategic uh, partners, secondary investors who would provide initial financing of the eight, 1.8 billion satellite communication systems known as Global Star. Um, this is the, uh, I believe... Wait, 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 stop. Don't go any farther because that's tomorrow night's subject. Oh, it is? Yes. Oh, okay then. <laughs> and uh, I sent you a little scoop on it. And this is what they're going to watch everybody on. Yeah, well, we've got it all here. We've had it for several days now, and I've just been waiting for a good time to do it, and tomorrow night's that time. Okay then, super. I'll be listening. <laughs> good. And also, too, you got any information on George Green? Who is he? <laughs> George Green was instrumental in the collapse of the savings and loans institutions in the state of uh, Texas. Uh, he has been uh, uh, filling the world with uh, lies and disinformation. Has published I don't know how many uh, books, maybe about sixty or seventy books, all purportedly uh, uh, channeled or, or written by some uh, space cadet named Hatton. Uh, most of it plagiarized by the from the writings of me and uh, Eustace Mullins and many other people. Some of it just outright garbage made up out of the clear blue sky. Uh, I don't know who he works for or, or what he is, but he is bad news wherever he is and uh, whatever he's doing. Okay, then. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. 602-333-2174. Good evening. You're on the air. Uh, yes, I'd be interested in hearing uh, your opinion of the... Uh... you got to turn off your radio. Assassination in Mexico, and I'll hang up and listen. Uh, I haven't devoted any time to that whatsoever. Tell you the truth, uh, I'm concerned about saving this country, and uh, I think the Mexicans should care about Mexico, and we should care about the United States of America. I just wondered if you thought we did it. I have no idea. <laughs> okay, thank you. But I'll tell you what, yes? uh, the name of George Bush's uh, petroleum company was Zapata Oil. The name of one of the ships that uh, was taking uh, supplies and, and uh, people for the invasion of Cuba was Zapata. The other one was Barbara, which is his wife's name. The Indians in southern Mexico who have uh, formed the revolution uh, are called the Zapatistas. Yes. It means the shoe. The shoe has always been a euphemism for the master. Great. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. 602-333-2174. I think the people who've always been in control are in control and are controlling now. <laughs> Good evening. You're on the air. Yes, sir, I'm calling from New York. My name is Bill Donovan. I'm head of the Catholic Defense League out here. Uh -huh. I get a lot of media attention. I want to get Sal Sharpton and destroy them. My question is this, and it might be twofold. Maybe, uh, maybe I'm a dreamer, but I'd like to know why do you, uh, or why do people seem not to pay attention to the issue of Jewry in this country? They're in firm control of America, and it's amazing that. Uh, you know, that as, as Americans, that we tolerate what they do. I mean, I can't believe that these people have not been insurrected against yet through their Freemason circles and all the other things that have gone on. That they're, they're firmly in charge of America. There, there's no way that we could butter that or water that down 
the Freemasonry, and which they're in control of, by the way. And um, I just don't understand why everybody tries to avoid the issue. The wealthy bankers are the Jews. The controllers of the military are the Jews. It always has been and always will be in this country. And there's nothing that anybody can say on these talk shows or stations or anywhere else that can get through to the people in this country. It's amazing. They've destroyed Russia. They've destroyed anything they've gotten their hands on from Christianity on down. They've destroyed it. It's terrible. It's disgusting. And, and for what they've done, I mean, I hear a lot about Christian identity out here, and I tell you the truth, as a Catholic, I really, I say they have a lot of uh, truth to what they say. I mean, it, it, religiously speaking, I think people should look into Christian identity. I think it's, it, they have a message, and I, I happen to get along with them. I, I'd like to meet some more, because out here in the Northeast, we don't have many Christian identity people that I know of. All right, but the main point or the main thrust I'm trying to make is that the people that go against me all the time and my Christianity and against Radio Free America and against the Boers in South Africa and against other forces in, South, in, in Russia on the right have always been and will always be the Jews because we're stupid. We are goys, that's for sure. Well, my comment is, if 3.8% of the population control all the rest of the population, and if that 3% of the population, 3.8% uh, of the population are Jews, then that makes the rest of us pretty stupid, doesn't it? Well, yeah, but they have different men, too. Well, now, wait a minute. If we're that stupid, maybe they deserve to control us. Uh, my, my, uh, message is, my message is, get smart no matter who's controlling us, or you're going to be a slave. And if you're not smart, you deserve to be a slave. Yeah, but I think we've got to wake up the people in this country, and I just don't see it happening. I well, I've been trying for a long time. We're out of time. Oh, I, thank you very much. I hate to cut you off, but and, and I'm not cutting you off because of your subject. I'm cutting you off because we're out of time. And I told the people I'd play this last cut, and there's not going to be time to play the whole thing, and I've got to give you this address one more time. Sweetwater Productions. Sweetwater Productions. Post Office Box 8222. Van Nuys, California. Nine one four zero nine. Ten dollars post paid. It's Sweetwater Productions, Post Office Box eight two two two, Van Nuys, California, nine one four zero nine. Folks, this whole argument that we're being picked on and somebody's controlling us and all this stuff is a bunch of bullshit. If we're that stupid, we deserve it. If we don't like it, we've got to stop being stupid, and we can control our own destiny. So, to me, placing the blame on other people and on other, other things, just don't cut the mustard. It's our fault. And until we change it, it's always going to exist. I don't like to hear anybody cry about the Jews or the blacks or the Aryans or anywhere else. We put out truth on this program to wake people up to take their power back. We are against socialism. We are for freedom for all peoples, all races, all religions, all colors, all creeds. And until that happens in this world, there will all be, always be wars. There will always be danger. There will always be muggers. There will always be thefts. There will always be sheeple. And there will always be slaves. Good night, and God bless you all.